بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In the name of Allah the most gracious the most merciful السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد We always commence by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sending blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam his entire household, his companions May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them all and bless every single one of us and grant us all goodness. This afternoon, we are speaking about embracing Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the messenger, may peace be upon him. And I'm sure we all know that when it comes to embracing the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, it would definitely be following his example, respect of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would be to confirm that he is indeed the final messenger, the one sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in order to teach us what Allah wants, in order to teach us how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So indeed, we thank Allah for giving us this beautiful opportunity to be able to go through this. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless every single one of us. Ameen. My brothers and sisters, I've been given the task of making mention of the man in white. The man in white, referring to whom? If I were to ask you, who is the man in white? Made mention of in the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Some might think it's the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself because he loved white and he said that even when people are being buried, they should use perhaps, in fact, it would be ideal or better to use white for the shroud that people are enshrouded in. However, the man in white is not referring to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's referring to someone else. We all know that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the best of creation, the most noble of all prophets, the final of all messengers, the one who has the highest status in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He who will be resurrected first. He who will enter paradise first. This is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He who will be granted the power to intercede on behalf of members of his ummah. That is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So one day when he was seated, and this is made mention of by Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, hadith in Sahih Muslim. He says, we were sitting with the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and a man walked in, a man came. Who was this man? He says, well, to describe him, he had white clothes on. He was a man in white, white clothes, so white, which means it was actually dazzling. You know, it was a white. Sometimes when you have white, you people ask me, how do you maintain the whiteness of your clothing? And I told them there is a trick and a secret. Can I let you know? You see, the detergent you purchase needs to be such that when you mix it with water, it doesn't become blue or green or another color. It actually remains white. Then your clothing will remain white. The minute you have the most beautiful detergent, but it changes color, or even the fabric softener, if it is blue or pink or purple, it will change the color of your white. So that's just one of my secrets. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. So at that time, there were no sophisticated detergents as we have today and fabric softeners and so on. But he was a man in dazzling white. Look at it. He says, Shadidu bayad thiyab which means his clothing were, was very, very white. And he had black hair, not just ordinary black, but proper black, jet black, complete. So black and white contrasting. And he was a person whom we did not know. We didn't know him. In fact, the narration starts off by saying, he had no sign of having made a journey, yet we did not know him, which means he came from somewhere far because we had no clue who this man was. And he didn't have a sign of having made a journey. Imagine a person comes and I'm just now imagining with my imagination and they're supposed to have come in from somewhere far away and there is no sign of any form of creasing on their clothing, no sign of tiredness in their face. And you just say, MashaAllah, SubhanAllah, look at this man. Subhanallah. 
So he comes in with white clothing, black hair. He's not known by the people and there is no sign that he had undertaken a journey. Subhanallah, the reason is he was not a man. He was not just, he was not a human being actually. He came in the form of a human being, but he was the angel Jibreel alayhi salatu wassalam. He was the angel Jibreel alayhi salatu wassalam. May peace be upon him and upon us all. So he walked in and he obviously attracted the attention of the people because Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu says, in this description, exactly as I made mention of a little bit earlier. And now he is sitting, he comes and he sits in the presence of Rasulullah He sat in front of Muhammad in a way similar to that which we sit when we are fulfilling salah. In the last part of the salah, we have something known as the tashahud or the qa'da, where we are sitting down and we are reading our tahiyyat. So he sat in a similar way. The only difference is he came so close to Muhammad sallallahu that the knees were literally touching his knees. He came in so close. So the two of them are now looking at each other and so close. No one knows him, but he was respectful. He didn't say anything disrespectful. And if people were watching and there were quite a few of the companions sitting there, they were watching, they saw, they are looking and they surprised. At the same time, amused to a certain extent because they don't know who he is. And he didn't introduce and nobody asked him, who are you? You know, when you enter the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is wrong to ask a question, brother, what are you doing here? Who are you? Whoever he is, he's allowed to come in or she's allowed to come in, subhanallah. You don't say, brother, you know what? Uh, what's your name? You know, just fill in the form before you come in. No, this is the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why I firmly believe and I feel the difference when I go to certain masajid, that masjid where people are made to feel comfortable, no matter what they are looking like, is a masjid that has in it sincerity of the people. It is a masjid that will attract a lot of people. The minute you come in and people just look at you as though, you know, with the eyes, you know, they make their eyes a little bit weird with their eyebrows coming up and down and so on. And they look at you like, you know, what are you doing here? You know, I recall when I was much younger, there was a person who used to live nearby a certain masjid. And one day they came for Salatul Fajr. And it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings us sometimes to his house through a difficulty we may be having in our lives. So when your life is flowing, everything is easy. Sometimes that's not a gift of Allah. It's a test of Allah. The gift is when things go the other way around. That's the gift. Because to be honest, all of us have a certain softness in the heart that is only felt when you have a problem, when you have an issue, you actually come down, not to your knees, but to sujood. You come down to cry to Allah, Oh Allah, I have a problem, I have a matter. I know of a person who fell ill and they fell ill, the bones began to ache, everything started happening and they started sorting out their problems they had with people because they started believing that, you know what, I've got very little to live and I'd better start sorting out my matters. Well, it's true. So this is why sometimes a difficulty in your lives or in our lives, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not make us go through that which is very difficult. But sometimes these issues actually are a gift of Allah because they bring us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Amazing. So this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept goodness in diversity when it comes to matters that occur in our lives. Sometimes like people say, you know, Allah doesn't love me. Why? Because I've been in the sickness for so long. Well, that's exactly the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's exactly the love of Allah. Aren't you crying? Don't you go to the masjid, the house of Allah? Don't you weep? Don't you raise your hands? The day you are cured, perhaps you might not come for Salatul Fajr anymore. So Allah says, hang on, I love you so much in this condition. I'm going to keep you in this condition. It's the best. And then you die in that condition. It's better than having got better in terms of sickness and further away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then have a sudden death when we were oblivious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is why we say the masajid, the houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, make people feel comfortable, greet them with a smile and don't go into detailed questions that make them feel uneasy in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
You know, imagine people enter the house of Allah, you want to read your salah, what do you go there for? Even the lecturer and the imam, I normally tell those who are imams in the masjid that look, don't get stuck into deep rooted politics where you're going to, you know, start attacking people and attacking names and so on. People have come here to learn something good. They have come here to get closer to Allah. They have come here to soften their hearts. They have come here to increase in spirituality and religiousness. And here you are giving them a speech about how bad a certain person by name is. Is that what they came for? It's important for us to know, make them feel comfortable and speak about something good. They want to go back educated about something regarding Islam. So when they go back, they feel like they're a good Muslim. They want to fulfill their salah. The next salah, they want to come back to the masjid because those smiles and the ambience they felt is missed. Imagine, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. You enter the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they look at you and they say, Brother, what business do you have? Well, you need to donate here in this box before you go in. Relax, take it easy. Hang on, the man will give on his own. But all you need to do is reach out, reach out to the people with a smile. Ensure that the people have bonded with the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah make us. I know I've spent a moment with this and the reason is, to me, it's very important. I think a lot of people are chased away of the how or from the houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of the attitude of some of the jama'ah, some of the Muslimin, and sometimes even those in charge. Attitude means a lot when it comes to a Muslim. Open your hearts. Not everyone's going to think like you. Not everyone's going to dress like you. Not everyone's going to be on your level of spirituality and religiousness. That does not make them worse than you in any way. Nor does it make you better than them. Rather, it is the way the life will end that will determine whether they are better or not. You know, when you start a race, interestingly, if you watch the long distance races, you know, 1,500 meters, 3,000 meters, you know, the three kilometer race, right at the beginning, the guy who's going to be first is perhaps tagging along at the back and he's slow and determined and others are racing, you know, and all their energy is gone. And then when there are a few hundred meters remaining, suddenly you see the man coming from the back. And he takes over one after the other and everyone starts clapping for him. Wow, look at this guy. He's coming. He's determined. He has this determination and he moves. Where were all the guys who were racing at the beginning? Oh, they're all tired, lagging along, you know, and, ta and they're now tired. They cannot run any further or any quicker. And here comes a man who was near the back and he wins the race. So do they then give the prizes according to how you started or how you ran in the middle? Or do they give you a prize according to how it ended? The same applies to your life, my brothers and sisters. We are running this race. Those who are determined, those who near the end, they become serious and they become people who really win the race are the ones who will get the prize. If I am a beautiful, powerful person today in, in the eyes of the people, and I might be a person who's trying to gain closeness to Allah, but because I despise others and so on, perhaps because of that, I might not win the race. And all this, where did, I, where did I divert from when it comes to the hadith? Because the Sahaba radiallahu anhum didn't ask Jibreel alayhi salam before or even after. Who are you? Where did you come from? What business do you have? I need to buy a vehicle from you. So give me your business card. Nothing of that happened. Today you meet someone, mashallah, the guy's driving a beautiful car. Someone has, and they said, you know what? Uh, what do you do, man, for a living? Because you're just looking at his car. He's, and when you passed him, and you smelt the scent, you said, Woo, Tom Ford, astaghfirullah, may Allah forgive us. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. You know, the oud wood, it's not so bad smelling, mashallah. But anyway, to be honest, people ask, hey, what do you do for a living? What do you have to do with what I do for a living? Did I pinch your money? Well, if I didn't, please keep quiet. There you are. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. We need to make people feel good, comfortable. So Jibreel alayhi salam comes in. And he sits down and he says, Ya Muhammad. Imagine he's addressing Muhammad Sallallahu Some might consider it a disrespectful way of addressing Muhammad Sallallahu because obviously the Sahaba radiallahu anhum in the majority of cases used to say, Ya Rasulallah Sallallahu Alaihi Especially after the verses were revealed in Surah, uh, in fact Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, La taj'alu dua ar-rasul baynakum ka dua'i ba'dikum ba'da. Don't let the calling of the messenger be similar to the calling of you, one another. You call him with utmost respect. So what you would have to do is, 
say something respectful. You know, if someone calls you by your nickname, they need to be close to you. With Muhammad sallallahu no nickname. He had a title, Rasulullah. Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ya Nabi Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That is called embracing the messenger because he was a messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Embrace him by calling him with the right name sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that's why the hadith says for us who are seated here and for us as Muslimin today, it is wrong. We are actually doing a disservice to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam if we hear his name and we do not say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam thereafter. Send blessings and salutations immediately upon he whom Allah has chosen to be better than us all, everyone. So to say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is actually an act of worship such that the reward of it returns to us tenfold according to the hadith. Man salla alayya wahidatan sallallahu alayhi biha ashra. Whoever sends blessings upon me once, Allah says, Allah sends blessings upon him tenfold, ten times. So if I want to be blessed, I need to say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, whenever, not only when I hear the name Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but even generally, we send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this man comes in, he sits down, he says, Ya Muhammad, tell me about Islam. I want to know about Islam. You want to know about Islam? The Prophet ﷺ didn't look at him and say, Who are you? Where do you come from? That's such a simple basic question. Everybody should be knowing that. Do you know today if someone says, especially when they dressed Islamically, you know, Oh, my, sister, my name is Maryam, for example. And uh, what is Islam? <laughs> Mashallah. Are you a Muslim? Yes. Well, obviously looking like a Muslim, named an Islamic name or an Arabic name. And what is Islam? And imagine if the speaker says, well, you know what? You should be knowing that. Let's move. Next question. The Prophet ﷺ didn't do that. He did not embarrass him. What is Islam? So he makes mention of something so powerful that to this day, we know these as the pillars of Islam. Confirmation of it comes from this hadith in Sahih Muslim. To say, yes, there are five pillars of Islam. What are the five, five pillars of Islam? There are other narrations, but this is one of the most important ones. And like I said, there were a lot of companions watching. They were listening attentively. Sometimes we have a Q&A and a person has a question that they desperately want to ask. But for some reason, they're either embarrassed or maybe they don't, you know, they don't want to ask the question thinking that it might be a question that's too simple or maybe this or that. So do you know what? Firstly, you're not supposed to be shy when it comes to asking questions. That is important to know. If you want to embrace Rasulullah how will you do it if you don't know the details of what he brought? If you don't know how he said embracing himself, he makes it quite clear to us. And you know what? The following of Muhammad is the most powerful way of embracing him. He makes it clear. But at the same time, subhanallah, a lot of us misunderstand it. And we think, you know, embracing means just to give a big hug. And no matter what you say and do thereafter, you're a hugger. You know what's a hugger? It means, hey, I give nice big hugs, but I don't mind what I say and do later on. No, not at all. I can give some of the best hugs. I think a lot of the boys here know that, don't they? Mashallah. Sheikh Allah as well, mashallah, he gives quite big hugs. The only thing, he's a bit taller than me, so I need to tiptoe. Subhanallah. But at the same time, my brothers and sisters, remember this. Don't be shy when it comes to asking questions. You need to know respectably or respectfully you ask a question. Don't be disrespectful in the way you ask. And don't ask in a way that perhaps the wording is cheap. You know, sometimes people use cheap words to ask a question. So ask it in the best way, but ask. So he says, and another thing, before I make mention of what the answer was, Sometimes we benefit by attending because a question is asked where we didn't know the answer or we didn't know the details. Thanks to someone who asked, we now found out. Subhanallah. It's beautiful because you and I may not have thought of something. Someone else did. They asked a question and we saying, hang on, I didn't know this. Well, now you do, don't you? So this is why it's important for us to listen, to attend, to be able to ask. And even if we're not asking, to be able to Appreciate those who do ask. So the Prophet ﷺ says, Al-Islam. Now he's answering saying, this is what Islam is. 
He says, he speaks about to bear witness that there is none worthy of worship besides Allah. Number one. إِقَامِ الصَّلَاةِ وَإِتَاءِ الزَّكَاةِ وَصَوْمِ رَمَضَانِ وَحَجِّ الْبَيْتِ مَنِ اسْتَطَاعَ إِلَيْهِ سَبِيلًا Five pillars of Islam. We all know them, don't we? So I can move on, can't I? MashaAllah. Okay, so just to quickly go through them. Al-Islam, what is made mention of when Islam is being spoken of in, in the same hadith or similar verse as the term Iman, you will always find that it is referring to actions. It is referring to the deeds of a Muslim, Islam. So if they are mentioned separately, then a lot of the times they refer to one and the same thing. But if they are mentioned together, then they refer to two different aspects. One is Iman, meaning the belief within, and Islam, meaning the submission and the actions. So this is why when you say the pillars of Islam and pillars of Iman, when you're speaking about pillars of Islam, you're talking about actions. I can actually see this with my eyes. If a person is fulfilling their salah, I can see it. If they're abstaining from food, I can see it. If they're giving their zakah, I can see it. If they're going for hajj, I can see it. If they're uttering the shahada, I can hear it. I can see it. But when it comes to iman, I cannot see it. They say, I believe. Well, whether you believe or not, Allah knows best. They say, I believe in the angels. I believe in the prophets. I believe in the books. I believe in the, the last day, good and bad and so on. I don't know. It's between you and Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you take a careful look at this, it's interesting because Islam in the Arabic language refers to a few things. You know, we will notice the root word made of three letters, sin, lam and meem, sa, la and ma. And if these three letters are looked at in the Arabic language, you get quite a few good things that come out of it. One is peace. And if you add another lamb in the center, it is a greeting. So this is why you get the greeting of peace. So you say salama, which means he greeted. He greeted. He greeted with what? With assalamu alaikum, with peace be upon you. So if you greet correctly, you are actually praying for someone to achieve peace. When I look at you, I'm saying, may you be at peace, which means any problem you have under the sun, any difficulty you're going through, no matter what it is, I pray that you are actually at peace from all of that. And I pray that you're at peace from my harm as well. I won't harm you. You should be at peace in every single way. So if a person is going through a sickness, financial problem, social problem, whatever else it is, any issues, I pray that you're at peace. May peace be upon you. What peace? As-salam. Alif and lam a lot of the times appears in the Arabic language to denote the entirety of the matter that is being spoken about. So salam, what type of salam? All types of peace, I hope and I wish and I pray for that for you. And this is why we say, take it seriously when you're greeting. Don't just say, you know, different accents, different parts of the world. They say, salakum in some places. Have you heard that? It's more the kum than anything else, you know. Allahu Akbar. People don't even know. And in some places I know, I visited one country and everyone says, Salaam. And I'm like, hang on. It's a proper prayer. Say it properly. Say it okay, you know. You get a reward for it. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. And you may add to it, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm adding to the prayer. I'm making a bigger prayer for you. And guess what? You get a reward for every segment of it. So add a few more segments, but don't add segments that are not from it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. We follow the sunnah. We want to embrace Rasulullah So we will greet the way he taught us. So the best greeting would be Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. That's a sunnah. So you're getting a double, triple, quadruple reward because not only the three segments, but the fact that that was part of the sunnah, you're getting it. May Allah make it easy for us to say these words. Sometimes we don't, you know. We don't. And really sometimes we cut it, chop it, change it. And one of the worst things is for a Muslim to replace it with hi. You know, when we were young, hi only meant someone who was on drugs. May Allah forgive us. <laughs> so my brothers and sisters, it's important to know that if you follow Islam, you will achieve peace. But following Islam, you find the term istislam also coming from a similar root of sin, lam and meme, which means to submit, to surrender. To surrender to what? To Allah. To surrender to the law of Allah. To surrender to what Allah wants. What does He want from you? He wants you to be disciplined. If you are disciplined, you will achieve peace. If you are not disciplined, you don't achieve peace. Remember this. 
I've used the term discipline because obviously rules and regulations need to be followed. Many people say in Islam, you know, there are a lot of rules and regulations, so I don't feel like entering the fold of Islam. Or it's very difficult to be a Muslim and so on. Lots of rules and regulations. Well, I tell you, think for a moment about something I'm about to say. Study those who are the most depressed. Or should I word it the other way? Study those who've let themselves loose. They have no rules and regulations. They do as they please. They have behavior that even animals don't engage in. Study them. You know, they'll party and they will go out every weekend and they drink and they're on drugs and they will, you know, commit adultery, fornication and they are literally having a ball of a time. They are the most depressed of people. They, have, they lead a very sad life. A lot of them are on antidepressants. Because they don't have rules, no discipline. They don't have something known as submission. Submission to what? Submission to the one who made you. That is the ingredient of contentment. Allah has kept a law such that the more you follow instructions of Allah, the more content you will be in your life. The happier you will be. People want happiness. I'm not happy. Why? I don't have money. Well, those who have money are even less happy than you are. So now, give me all your money. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us all. <laughs> that was just a joke. Don't, don't, don't pile up a note, a, a word of notes here. But the truth is, yes, those who have, you know, those who have focused on wealth alone, wealth has never brought about happiness. I recall a brother I met very recently, a wealthy brother, and he says, Wallahi, I used to be such a happy man. And now that I have wealth, I'm so stressed and depressed because my kids are fighting, my family is fighting. I don't know what to do. The more I give, the more I'm depressed. And so we happened to look into what was happening and so on. And I still, I believe that the way to achieve contentment is to go back to Allah, to dedicate yourself, starting with that salah that you will fulfill for Allah, no matter what. You know, you can be a person who's got so many obligations on earth. But when the time of prayer comes, a winner, and the richest person is he who can put aside the entire dunya, the whole world put on one side. And you say, this is my salah. It may just be the last prayer I'm going to be allowed to fulfill. Here goes Allahu Akbar. Oh Allah, you are the greatest. And then you see the contentment you have. You see the happiness you have. You see the heaps of wealth that were there or that was there would never bring about that happiness that you will achieve from salah. Subhanallah. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum was so content. Today, perhaps a lot of people have more in terms of figures. But they, they are not as wealthy. Because wealthy has not got to do with materialism alone. It's got to do with so much more. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. So this is the term Islam that I'm speaking about. You want to achieve the peace, you have to submit. There is no other way of achieving inner and outer peace. And not only will you achieve peace in this world, but even peace in the next, you will achieve it. You will get closer to Allah in this world and the next. So when you arrive on the day of judgment, do you know that there are narrations that tell us that there will be people graded on the day of judgment. There will be a grading done very quick, but it will be done. What's the grading? You have the VIPs and you have the others. And then you have people who are perhaps, may Allah forgive us, sinful who will be struggling in a different way altogether. People who are total disbelievers who will perhaps be graded in a totally different way. So some of these VIPs, do you know what the hadith says? رَجُلٌ قَلْبُهُ مُعَلَّقٌ بِالْمَسَاجِدِ So many categories. One of them is a person whose heart is stuck or hanging in the house of Allah. You know, muallak means to be hanging. So it's hanging, meaning it's the time of salah. I fulfilled my salah. I'm, I can't wait for the next salah. If that's your attitude, you've now achieved a bit of success. Because your heart is hanging. It's waiting. It wants the next prayer. Subhanallah. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us ease and to make us from those who can surrender so that we can achieve peace. Like I said, the more rules they are, the happier you will be. And we've given the example of those who have let themselves loose and they are the most depressed. So it did not bring about any happiness. Not at all. I've known of some brothers and sisters who've led a life full of disbelief and sin the day they turned to Islam and dedicated it to Allah they say no matter what we had in the past we have never ever tasted this type of sweetness and goodness worshipping our maker alone this is what Islam offers 
So the pillars of Islam are quite clear. Like I said, the Shahada, you, you, you declare that you believe in Allah alone. You, you worship your maker alone. No association of partnership with him in any way whatsoever. Neither his names nor his qualities, not at all. He is the one worthy of worship. And this is why when we declare a Shahada, we say the meaning of it is not, you know, just a literal translation in the Arabic language because the Arabic language is far deeper than the English language. So we would say there is none worthy of worship besides Allah. If you say there is no God besides Allah, one might argue, well, there are so many gods being worshipped besides Allah. So when you say La ilaha illallah in the Arabic language, yes, it may just translate as there is no God but Allah. Yet the proper translation of it is there is no God worthy of worship. The other gods are not worthy of worship because they are not deities. They are not actually gods. I mean, if someone worships, you know, a carpet or this speaker, microphone or anything else, people do sometimes. It's a fact. People actually do. They will worship and say, that's my God. So if we say there is no God but Allah, what we mean is there is no God worthy of worship besides the one who made you. Remember this. And this is Islam. This is the way Allah grants us success in this world and the next. You worship Him alone. So none worthy of worship besides Allah. No one in absolute control of every aspect of existence besides Allah. Remember, who owns my existence? Allah. My happiness, my sadness. Allah. My wealth, everything else, my health, Allah. So when I ask for health and happiness, who do I seek from? Allah and Allah alone. That is Islam. And then his names and qualities. If someone is most forgiving, most merciful, can I use that to describe another human being or a creature of Allah? I can say, this guy is merciful. But I can't say he is the merciful, not at all. The merciful is Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let's know this. The names and qualities of Allah, unique to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is the owner of the day of judgment. Allah is the one in absolute control of every aspect of existence. Subhanallah. May Allah help us in all our issues, the difficulties we may be facing. May He grant us ease in this world and the next. Amin. So, we declare this. We've uttered it. We've said it. Thereafter, we pray for the sake of Allah five times a day. We know this. We should be praying. People ask, well, why is it timed? You know, why is the timing this way here? Why is it one just before sunrise? The other one is just after the zenith. And the other one perhaps is in the late afternoon. And the other one is just after sunset and one late at night. Why this timing? To be honest with you, whether you know it or you don't know it, that is the ingredient of your peace, your serenity, your comfort, your contentment, your success in this world and the next. Some may be able to explain to you and some not. I remember once my dad told me many years ago when I was young and we were speaking about Salatul Fajr, very young. And you know, when you're young, my father used to actually sit next to my bed and he used to tap me and he used to say, get up for Salah. And I would say, okay, you know what's the password? Just now. That's the password. Just now. Okay. And dad would then sit next to my bed. He would put out his sajada and read his sunnah. And he would make sure he's sitting there until I get up. And then I, I asked him once, I asked him, you know, we have to get up so early. He says, wouldn't you like to breathe the fresh oxygen before people breathe it? And I'm looking at it and I'm, I'm thinking, you know what, is this man crazy, you know? I'm breathing fresh oxygen before others breathe it. Allah wants you to breathe the fresh morning air. And I thought, okay, he's just pulling my leg. Wallahi, when I grew up, I found that subhanallah, doctors tell people to go out early in the morning to take deep breaths. And here we are as Muslimin, walking to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we don't realize that this oxygen is actually in the purest of its form at that time of the morning. Give good news to those who walk to the masajid in the darkness of the night of having a a, a complete nur and light on the day of judgment. And we think, you know what? Oh no. 
It's probably it's just something heavy that Allah's imposed on us. Not at all. There will be health benefits that you don't know about, such as sujood and prostration. You put your head down on the ground, subhanallah, you don't realize that that is the only position a human being can comfortably get into, whereby the brain is lower than the heart, so the gravity is actually pumping that blood effortlessly to your brain. Subhanallah. And we just think to ourselves, yeah, it's sujood. You know what? Let's pack it as quick as possible. You know, Ramadan is over. Let's make a better plan for next Ramadan. Do you know why I say this? Because sometimes in Ramadan, people think of taraweeh. And taraweeh, you know, it's, it's derived from raha. Raha means to rest, to take it easy. And what people do, literally they peck on the ground like chickens. They want to get down and out and done. May Allah forgive us. Take your time with taraweeh. I always say it's got to do with quality, never ever quantity. Remember this. It's got to do with quality. I'd rather fulfill two units of prayer with proper concentration, taking my time than to fulfill many more, just pecking and insulting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember this. This is Islam. This is Salah. Salah, the timing is from Allah. We will benefit from it. Obviously, people have discussed it. And I could go into it, but obviously... Time constraints. We won't go into the details of the timing and why every salah was timed in a specific way. But the bottom line is whether you know it or not, understand that that submission is what will bring you to the point of contentment and happiness in this world and the next. Similarly, when it comes to why do we have to pray in Arabic? Have you ever heard that? It's a, it's a decent question to be honest with you. It's a very decent question. Why do we have to pray in Arabic? Hang on. What do you mean when you say pray? Do you mean a supplication or do you mean a specific type of actions, movements, or should I say uh, words with actions that starts in a certain way and ends in a certain way five times a day? Which one are you talking about? So they're confused because the word pray does not necessarily translate as salah in the Arabic language. It could mean dua. So dua is a supplication. If you tell a Christian, look, can you please pray? They will supplicate. But when you tell a Muslim, can you pray? They have to ask you, what do you mean? You want me to, to, to pray for you? Which means supplicate for you? Or would you like me to... Or are you talking about offering the five daily prayers, which is salah? Only a Muslim can divide that. So if it is salah, salah is beautiful. Every one of us needs to contribute towards the protection of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the Quran. Every one of us. So... Once you declare yourself as a Muslim, one of the things you will definitely do and you have to do is to memorize the word of Allah as it was spoken by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the language that Allah has chosen. Even if it means a small chapter, you know, a lot of us would memorize Surah Al-Fatiha, right or wrong? Surah Al-Fatiha, you know it, put up your hand. You don't know it. Okay, that's better, mashallah. Surah Al-Fatiha. And then a lot of us know Surah Al-Ikhlas, Surah Al-Kawthar. You know, if I say, Inna a'tayna kal kawthar, my little two-year-old will be able to complete that, inshallah. I hope so. And then when I say, Qul huwa Allahu ahad, you know, that's Surah Al-Ikhlas. I think everyone should be knowing that off by heart. And this is the reason why a lot of us, when we fulfill our salah, guess what? We're guilty of using these two shortest surahs and that's it. <laughs> by default. Have you heard that one? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us learn a bit more. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors, really. So, if you take a careful look at this, each one of us have learned it in the Arabic language, even though we don't speak the Arabic language, because that's our dedication to Allah. We will say it in the Arabic language because so many reasons. One of them is, at least I know I've contributed towards the protection of this book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by memorizing a certain portion of it. Everyone's memorized different, different amounts. But I have. So this is salah. So many other aspects we won't go into regarding salah. Thereafter you have saum or zakah. Zakah is the alms that we give to the poor. When you say charity, there's a problem with the word. The reason is charity in the English language is wholly and solely and totally voluntary. But when it comes to zakah, it's not a voluntary charity. It's something you have to give. So it's not a tax either. But it's something between, and this is why we say it's difficult to use in the English language to translate the words of the Arabic language without a proper explanation to say, look, zakah is actually an act of worship whereby you need to reach out to those who are deserving or certain categories of people 
in such a way that a certain amount of your wealth or your savings, a specific type of your wealth, a certain percentage of it needs to go out annually. Wow, what an explanation. And we just say charity. Zakah, charity. Salah, prayer. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. And thereafter, you look at psalm and fasting. Fasting also, you know, I was surprised when I was young. I, and I recall this because as you grow older, you begin to see different things, you know. And you begin to mature. And you, you know, the, the, the people of other faiths, they fast as well. So I, I was once faced with someone uh, saying, I'm fasting. And they were busy eating. And I'm thinking, but how are you fasting? No, we just have to stay away from certain foods. And I'm like, okay, that's not fasting. That's more like slowing. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. When we fast, we're serious. We don't eat anything. We don't drink anything. You know, some people fast. So they say, I'm not allowed to have salt. Okay, what's that? That's not a fast. I don't mind, you know, roasted chicken without salt. It's, I'll just get used to it. But I'll enjoy it because I'm so hungry. You know, when you're hungry, anything tastes good. Have you noticed that? I remember my mom, I used to tell her, oh, this tastes so good. She says, that's just because you're hungry. I said, nobody does. She says, yeah, yeah just because you're hungry. When you're full, then tell me. So when I was full, I said, I don't feel like eating. She says, you see, no matter how tasty this food is, you don't even feel like eating it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to appreciate those who cook for us. Amin. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to appreciate those who cook for us. Amin. That's better, mashallah. I see most of the men said it quite loudly. It shows who cooks. <laughs> So my brothers and sisters, this is zakah, this is the, the psalm, and then we have hajj. Man istata'a ilayhi sabeelan. Before I continue, one point regarding the hajj. I know in this country it's not so easy to go for hajj. In a lot of Muslim countries because they have a quota. Wallahi, my brothers and sisters, it's important for us as soon as we can afford. We need to make sure that we try our best. You know, we apply, we make sure we try and so on. There are some people in certain lands who afford it, who can afford it, but they don't make an effort. They think, you know what, I'm not ready for Hajj. I know back at home, and I come from the southern tip of Africa, the southern part of Africa. You have some people who will tell you, you know what, yeah, Hajj, okay, I've got the wealth, I've got the money, but I'm not yet ready for it. You know what that means? In other words, I still need to sin a little bit in my life before I go to make peace with Allah. That's what it means to me. Someone who tells you, do you know what, I, I, I'm not ready for Hajj, which means, hey, I can't give up this girlfriend of mine. Astaghfirullah. That's all it means. To be honest with you, you can and you must. Allah decides when you have to go. Your, your life needs to change. And I always say, to fulfill the Hajj is easy, but to live as a Haji is what is difficult. Do you know what that means? I fulfilled my Hajj. One of the signs of a successful Hajj is when you come back from Hajj, your life needs to have changed somehow. One of the signs of a successful Ramadan and our Ramadan have just, or our Ramadan has just passed is that your life has changed some way in this Ramadan. So if Ramadan comes in, my scarf comes on, my cloak comes on, my Quran comes out, you know, uh, the men, mashallah, they start coming to the masjid and reading their salah and so many things happening. And as soon as the moon is sighted, everything gone. Everything gone. Have you noticed, you know, the sunnah of, of keeping a beard? So people in Ramadan, sometimes they forget about Gillette and everything else. They leave it, you know. And sometimes the sisters, mashallah, you know, the scarf comes out and they look so, mashallah, wow, alhamdulillah, subhanallah, you know. You might be wondering, how do you know? Okay, I'm just saying, it's not, I'm not speaking about something in particular, okay. I'm just saying, giving you an example. So amazingly, or should I say strangely or sadly, the wind blows as the moon is sighted. And what does it blow off? It blows off the scarf and it blows off the beards. Allahu Akbar, everything gone. The wind is blown. The houses of the Muslimin, everything changes. Let's not be those who are affected by the wind blowing on the eve of Eid. That's a day of happiness. You've changed, change your life. Do you know the hadith says whoever has fasted in the month of Ramadan correctly, properly, uh, expecting a reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all their sins are forgiven. They start a new leaf. How do I know that my sins are forgiven? Well, if my life has changed to a certain extent. My life has changed to a certain extent. So I'm happy and I feel closer to Allah. If that happens every Ramadan, Wallahi, by the time five or ten Ramadans have passed, I will be feeling so close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah help us to fulfill our duties unto Him. We were speaking about Hajj and how to tell that the Hajj is accepted if 
one of the signs I would say is if your life has changed somehow, then indeed you are closer to Allah. The greater chance of your Hajj have been, having been accepted. So many people, uh, interestingly, I will say two more things about Hajj. So many people go for Hajj, when they come back, they are okay for a while and after that they forget, they back into their old ways and habits. Let that never happen. Secondly, something interesting in West Africa that I picked up was the pride they have. And when I say pride here, I'm not talking of haughtiness, but I'm talking of being happy. You know, I'm proud to be a Muslim. Doesn't mean I'm arrogant to be a Muslim. It means I'm happy to be a Muslim. Like I said, the word pride in the English language, you know, you need the Arabic to explain it. So it's not to do with takabbur. It's not to do with something, you know, haughtiness. But the pride they have in calling themselves Al-Hajj or al hajja you know, Al-Hajj, Hassan. Why does he have to be called Al-Hajj? To keep reminding him that, hey, you've made Hajj. Allahu Akbar, I was shocked. I told him, but why? Just say brother so-and-so. No, this guy is Al-Hajj. So much so that some of the footballers were known as Al-Hajj. Have you known that? Hey, brother. You're not supposed to be there. Football pitch, mashallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant success to all those sportsmen who are Muslimin. Help them to, grow, to be given the balance between their deen and what they've chosen. You know, it's not right for us to condemn sport, but definitely we need to strike a balance and know as Muslimin, we owe Allah whatever we owe Him and we will not compromise that. But at the same time, we do have, we do have permissibility to participate in that which does not displease Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alhamdulillah. So this is why they call themselves Al-Hajj. Al-Hajj, in order to keep on reminding you. Let's move on further. So the Prophet sallallahu answered Jibreel alayhi salatu was salam with these very brief points. He says, believe in Allah or to utter the shahada, salah, zakah, saum and hajj. So he says, you've spoken the truth. Imagine the man asking the question, heard the answer, and then he says, that's right, you've spoken the truth. Subhanallah, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum were quiet, they were silent. Now listen carefully, the Sahaba learned something because they heard this order being given to these pillars of Islam. So they obviously learned something and from amongst them, there might have been some who had refreshed the knowledge that they had. So it was beneficial for all of them. But none of them butted in to say, how can you say that? How can you do this? Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, who's normally a person who likes to get up and deal with things physically, he just says, ajibna lahu. Yes, alu, who are you saddiquhu? We were surprised. This man came in, he's asking a question. When the answer came, he says, yeah, you're right. So why did you ask? Meaning, you know, if you knew what it was, why did you ask me? But they just said, we were surprised, but we let it pass. They didn't make a noise because they knew that perhaps someone wants to learn. Maybe that's his style. Maybe that's his way. Not everyone's going to have the same style and way. Not everyone's going to be a person who's, you know, I recall, wallahi, I saw a brother with a huge tattoo exposed. Okay. And he walked. It was, this was in an airport. And he walked through. He looked at us. He greeted us. And I was surprised. I said, from all people, you know, they don't greet in a rush. Even Muslims don't greet in a rush. Have you noticed that? You see a guy who's a proper Muslim or someone and they'll be the furthest away. Sometimes you greet and they're like, <laughs> what's wrong? Wa alaykum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Let me earn the reward, man. You're supposed to respond to a greeting. But like, who are you? It's like the application form I was, you know, about to, uh, or I was speaking about that you need to fill in an application. The minute they know who you are or how much money you have or what you're worth. Oh, sorry, man. I didn't even hear the greeting. Brother, you heard the greeting. You didn't reply because that time you didn't know I was the owner of the business you were walking to. That's the Muslim's condition today. May Allah forgive us. It's a sign of the hour where as-salamu lil ma'rifah. You know, salam will only be when you know someone, you want something from them. That's it. Imagine we have non-Muslims who greet us. Whenever I've been in a lift or whenever I've been uh, on public transport, when they're non-Muslims, they'll greet you, morning, sir, how are you doing? And, what's... and I'm like, wow, okay, good morning. Okay, you know, fine. I greet them back and I will. But why is it the Muslimin have a problem? We don't greet. We don't greet each other. I've seen Muslims greet non-Muslims, but they won't greet another Muslim. Wallahi, I tell you. I've seen it happening. They'll greet non-Muslims. Hi, how are you? Hi. Come on, relax. This, this person is not, this person is even higher because they are Muslims. You're acknowledging someone who's lower by saying hi. 
And this person who's really high, there's no salam for them, mashallah. Well, that's a weakness of Islam. That's why we're speaking about, or should I say weakness of the Muslims. That's why we're speaking about it as is, Islam teaches us something, but what the Muslims are doing is sometimes something else. So subhanallah. He then asks Muhammad sallallahu another question. He says, tell me about Iman. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi says, the pillars of Iman, one after the other. He says, to believe in Allah. Obviously, that shahada that you uttered, now you believe in it. You believe in it with your heart. And that is known to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the angels, and the books, and the messengers, and the last day, subhanallah. And the fact that good and bad fate comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we believe in Allah. I've already touched on that. The angels, these are creatures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created by Allah. They do not have the ability to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why man, man, if man obeys Allah's instruction, having the ability to disobey, obviously he achieves a far greater reward than one who doesn't even have the ability to disobey. So you have the ability to disobey. You can, you can forget about your salah, forget about your duties unto Allah. You, you know, you can go and commit sin, but you haven't because you love Allah. You are submitting to Allah. You want to get close to Allah. You want to embrace Rasulullah Wasallam. So everything is quit because you know Allah sent Muhammad Wasallam, and this is the message and I will follow the message as best as I can. In that case, you are surely higher or you are surely achieving a greater reward than one who doesn't have the ability to sin, not at all. This is why there is a debate or difference of opinion amongst the scholars as to whether those who are obedient from amongst the humankind are actually higher than the angels. There is a discussion in this regard. And I lean to the opinion that says, yes, they can be because of this fact. The angels don't have the ability to disobey. They don't. La ya'soon Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, they do not oh, disobey Allah. They don't get tired. They are created with nur. They are created in a totally different way. And they don't have the ability to disobey. They are given tasks. They fulfill them exactly as is. So when man has the ability and he still obeys Allah, having the ability to disobey, surely there is a feather on his cap that is not achieved by those who don't have the ability to disobey. So from among the angels, some are higher than others, some are more well known. Allah has chosen whom he wants with the tasks he wants to give them. Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam came down with revelation. And this is why at the time of the Prophet sallam, some of them said, we don't like Jibreel because he came down with the punishment and he came down with this and he came down with that. And Allah says, well, it's Allah who decides whomsoever he wishes to send as a messenger, he will send from amongst the angels. Allahu yastafi min al-malaikati rusulan wa min nas It is Allah who chooses the messengers from amongst the angels as well as from amongst the people. Allah chose. It's not me or you who choose. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who chooses. So we believe in the angels and we believe that they are the creatures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah has tasked them with certain tasks and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows why and how he has done all of that. So the angels, the books of Allah, all of them we believe in them. The Quran is the book that we believe in detail in. And the reason is, Yes, the other ones are there. We have the Psalms of David. We have the, the, the Torah. We have the Talmud. We have, for example, in fact, we have the other scriptures that are revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In brief, in a nutshell, we confirm that these are revealed books and these are the people or these are the messengers they were revealed to. But at the same time, we do admit that there has been some tampering that has happened to, with those books and therefore not everything in those books is accurate. And this is why the Quran, like I said moments ago, all of us have memorized certain portions of it. Some of us, perhaps the entire Quran. In the same language that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose for it. And this is why if you take a careful look, a careful look at this memorization of the Quran, it's unique. It is something amazing. Allah has made it easy. 
And there are people who don't speak the Arabic language who will know it cover to cover to the degree that some of those who don't know the Arabic language, you tell them, what does it say on page number so and so or verse number so and so and they will recite it for you and they don't know the Arabic language. Different people are on different levels when it comes to the memorization of the Quran. And this is why I always say that you see when it comes to the previous scriptures, if you take a careful look, people adjusted the scriptures by translating the scriptures in order for them to understand it. And we are taught to adjust ourselves to understand the word of Allah. So you don't adjust the word of God because you don't understand it, but you adjust yourself to understand the word of God. So that is why the Quran is not lost. Every one of us, we have heard that, yes, it is important to recite the Quran. When I say recite here, I'm speaking of those who don't know the Arabic language, reading the Arabic. It's very important. You will get 10 rewards for every letter. But guess what? It's equally important to read the English or to try and understand it. Knowing that the English is only man's attempt to explain to you what he believes is the closest to that which Allah wants to say. It's not an accurate, accurate translation per se. No. And this is why you have a, a little bit of wording sometimes that might be different. People know it's translation. And you will notice the Arabic is usually on one side. Because it's like an indemnity to say, listen, hang on guys. I am translating, I'm trying to explain to you what Allah is saying, but the proper word of Allah is here. So I might, I might have a little bit of, you know, difficulty explaining to you, but this is the word. So if you know the Arabic language, here it is, you will understand it much better. I'm sure you've noticed that. Where have you seen a Bible with the Aramaic on one side and the English on the other? I haven't seen a single one, not one. Subhanallah. May Allah forgive us. May Allah grant us the ability to understand how favored we are. So we believe in all the books in brief and in the Quran in detail. And the messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all of them, we believe in them, we respect them. When people draw cartoons or when people make movies that are blasphemous against any one of those, including Jesus, may peace be upon him, Moses, may peace be upon him, Muhammad, may peace be upon him, we will be equally insulted. Because for us, they were all noble messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us and protect us. Also, as we move further, we understand Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the final of messengers. No one comes after him in terms of prophethood. It's sealed, it's closed. That is part of the belief of a Muslim. And then we believe there will be a last day. Everything's going to come to an end. Either I come to an end before that day or the day comes and then I come to an end. But that's up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then we believe there will be a resurrection where Allah resurrects us and we will be questioned and there is heaven and there is hell. And we believe that Allah's mercy is so great that we have hope in it. He says, I will forgive those whom I wish to forgive. Anyone I want to forgive, I will forgive. But I don't forgive those who associate partners with me. Some people misunderstand this. I remember a person asking me very recently a question saying that Allah says he doesn't forgive shirk. So, even if I make tawbah, am I wasting my time? And I said, my brother, you've misunderstood it. When Allah says, Inna Allah, la an yushraka bih, Allah does not forgive when association of partnership with Him has occurred. He is speaking about those who've died without repenting. So when you die without repenting and you get to Allah and He sees that you have so many sins, He is telling you, I still may forgive those who have not sought repentance for other sins. But when it comes to shirk, if there's no repentance, I'll just leave it at that. It's up to him. This is what he said. So in your life, you have a chance for as long as you're breathing. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum to face facts. The bulk of them, the majority of them, before they accepted Islam were mushrikeen. They were associating partners with Allah. They were not People who were on Tawheed, for example, they were not people who were worshipping one Allah. No, they were worshipping their stones and their sticks and their idols and so on. They were not from amongst those who worshipped Allah alone. But when they asked for forgiveness, when they turned to Allah, Allah forgave them. They became the best of people. So this is referring to one who dies and, and has not asked Allah's forgiveness from shirk. Then Allah says, I won't forgive them. So someone says, but why won't Allah forgive them? Listen, I don't know. It's Allah who decided that. I know He is merciful and I know He is most forgiving, 
But when he decides things, I've got no say in it. You know, I once had a Christian man tell me that, you know, your God says he won't forgive sins, certain sins. And I said, what do you mean? He says, well, if you've died, uh, like you just said now, meaning like I said just now, if you've died and you haven't asked for forgiveness from, say, the sin of association or partnership, then you're not going to be forgiven. So what's the point? And I said, hang on, you know, don't pick on us. This is called picking, picking on Muslimin for no reason. Allah is most forgiving, most merciful. He will forgive and he will definitely grant mercy. And when he has said something, he knows why he has said it. So if he says he's not going to forgive, it's up to him. But you know what? You guys believe that someone else is punished because of your sins. May Allah forgive us. He says, now you picking. I said, I'm not. I'm doing exactly what you did. And I can go a step further. You guys believe that God had to kill someone because of other people's sins. We believe that blood doesn't need to be spilled in order to forgive. No, Allah will forgive you without killing anyone. He doesn't need to kill anyone. Subhanallah. This is why we say Islam is based on mercy. The mercy of Allah is not connected to spilling the blood of anyone. The mercy of Allah is direct, immediate. You ask Allah's forgiveness, He forgives you. You ask Allah alone, He will, he will grant you. Keep on asking. Subhanallah. Never lose hope in the mercy of Allah. There was something I wanted in my life. This is my personal example. And I was calling out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I never lost hope. And subhanallah, a year passed, two years passed, five years passed, ten years passed. Every single day, I asked for something. Fifteen years passed, sixteen years passed. And it happened. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. It's my own personal example. And I know Allah hears. 16 years later, calling out not once, so many times a day, every single day. And it came. Subhanallah. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's his gift. People lose hope. You call out to Allah a day, two days, and you think, Oh Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, you haven't heard me. Wallahi, yes, I might have gone through days, but I had no option but to call out to Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oh Allah, you are the only one who can sort out this problem for me. You are the only one who can help me here. 16 years later, it flicked, came in. And I'm completely, completely, dedicatedly, in absolute belief, that Allah heard the first dua, the first prayer. He knew what was right, when it was right, how it was right, why, and everything. And He gives you at the moment, it is the best for you. Subhanallah. Iman, belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we believe that there is a last day. We believe we will be resurrected, heaven and hell. And we also believe good and bad fate comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A quick clarification. There are people who sit back and say, well, if Allah has decreed everything, then I can just sit back and whatever's written for me will fall from the ceiling. That's what there are people who actually believe this. Do you know that? There are people who say, if everything is decreed, let me sit. Even in marriage, there are people who just sit and say, well, you know, I'm just waiting for the proposals to come in. What? You mean you're not going to make any effort, your parents, your father or anyone else, no effort whatsoever? No one's going to make an effort? Well, then you might just sit single forever. May Allah forgive us. The same applies to wealth. If Allah's written that I'm going to be a millionaire, it's coming. Maybe He's written that you're going to sleep in your bed and be the poorest person ever. And you're going to struggle without food or drink because you're lazy. May Allah forgive us. The hadith clearly says, make an effort to achieve what is beneficial for you, then lay your trust in Allah. Didn't Allah give you your hands? Didn't He give you a capacity? Don't blame destiny for your laziness. Not at all. Yes, when something you've tried hard to achieve and it doesn't happen, then you say, you know what? It was predestined. There we are. But if you haven't even tried, and this is why the narration says, إِحْرِصْ عَلَى مَا يَنْفَعُكْ وَاسْتَعِنْ بِاللَّهِ وَلَا تَعْجَزْ 
Work hard to achieve what is beneficial for you. I want to achieve a degree. I need to go to the college. I need to enroll. I can't just sit at home and say, oh, life is written for me. Someone will pass by my house and come inside and say, hey, anyone wants a degree? Come, let's go. And then I'm going to go and I'm going to everything. That's never going to happen. Not at all. You know, you have your, you want to market your product. You need to go out and market it. You can't just think, Ya Allah, if you've decided that people are going to buy my product, you know, they, they will pop into my house and say, Oh, I believe you're selling X, Y, and Z. Let me buy from you. Not at all. That's not going to happen. You were a fool. Perhaps you needed medication. May Allah forgive us. <laughs> yes, it's true. People do this. So you need to make sure you made an effort and, and work hard. Don't be lazy. Then when something comes, don't start blaming here and there. Say, look, I tried my best, it's Allah. Like the hadith says, uh, you know, you tie your camel and then you say, I lay my trust in Allah. You don't just leave the camel loose and say, I lay my trust in Allah and I'm gone. And then you come back and there's no camel. But Allah, I laid my trust in you. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told you to tie it. You didn't. So who is to blame? Subhanallah. So Jibreel alayhi salam hears this in brief, these six pillars of Iman. And he says, Sadaqt, yeah, you've spoken the truth. Again, Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu says, we were surprised. And then he says, tell me about Ihsan. What is Ihsan? Tell me about Ihsan. The Sahaba are listening, radiallahu anhu. Like I said, refreshing their knowledge and perhaps in maybe in some cases gaining even more knowledge. So he, the Prophet sallallahu looks at him and says, Al-Ihsanu an ta'bud Allah ka'annaka tara, fa'in lam takun tarahu fa'innahu yarak. Al-Ihsan is to worship Allah as though you are seeing Him. And if that is not the case, then to worship Allah knowing that He is watching you, these are two different levels. Now if you just analyze these two beautiful levels, you will see the difference between the two. If I am worshiping Allah as though I am watching Him, I am concentrating, I am focused, I am dedicated. My act of worship is so valuable. It is so great because it's as though I'm seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imagine you're fulfilling salah and it's as though you're seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some people might find that difficult. Hence, you have the second part of the hadith. Allah is watching you. So I know Allah is watching me. So if Allah is watching you, again, you are fearful of Him. Fearful in a nice sense. Not fearful as in, hey, He's going to burn me. No. Fearful in that you want to please Him. You want to make sure things are done correctly. Allah's watching you. Allah knows. So it keeps you away from that which is bad. It keeps you away from evil. You are now fulfilling an act of worship. Knowing that Allah is watching you. You do it correctly. Because to show off to anyone besides Allah is known as association of partnership with Allah. But to show off to Allah is an act of worship. Oh Allah, I'm doing it for you. Imagine, and wallahi, try this out. You get up at night and you say, oh Allah, this is only for you. No one knows. And you, you go to the bathroom to make your wudu, mashallah. Say, oh Allah, this is only for you. If it wasn't for you, I wouldn't have done this. Subhanallah. And then you say, oh Allah. And you're just speaking. Who are you speaking to? Allah, just you and Allah. Oh Allah, you're watching. See me, I'm your slave. I'm your worshiper. I'm getting up just for you. I'm here, oh Allah. And then you will make the best wudu. Trust me, because... It's Allah, you're showing off to him to say, listen, I'm doing it properly. Here it is, here it goes. And then you get to your sajjada or musalla, whatever you call it, and you lay it out. And mashallah, you want to start, you say, oh Allah, I'm reading this for you, subhanallah. So between you and Allah, it's just for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you start your prayer and you're taking it easy. And you know, you might want to read in the most melodious, beautiful voice. You take your time and you say, oh Allah, this is for you. It is far more valuable than just getting over and done with the salah. I need to do the wudu, so I'm just washing my hands and I don't know whether I've done the masah properly and half the time I, I'm gone. I walk five meters and I say, hang on, did I wash my hands? That's because you weren't concentrating. Nothing, your mind was somewhere else. Like you're reading salah, you say Allahu Akbar and you're doing it for the sake of Allah. When you're reading Surah Al-Fatiha, you want to... Show off to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you know, you're reading it correctly. You're thinking about the meaning and how beautiful it is. When you say, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. You're actually speaking to the same Allah. He's listening. He's watching. He knows. Amazing form of spirituality, religiousness. But a lot of us, we do it in order to get done with it. Do you agree? Wallahi, I'm being honest with you. We do it in order to get done with it. So we just say, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Behind the Imam, subhanallah, but what happened to your Fatiha? What happened to everything else? And what happened to... Oh, but before I could read it, the Imam was already down. No, no excuse. Subhanallah. 
or we start thinking of everything else. And then we write a letter to the Sheikh or to anyone else. You know, I have a problem of concentration in Salah. Yes. So at least try and show Allah, try and impress Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Take out unnecessary things from your mind and your head. You'll be able to concentrate a little bit better in your Salah, in your prayer. Subhanallah. This is Salah. And this is Ihsan. To worship Allah as though you are seeing Him. If not, then at least know that He is watching you. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a very high level. And it's a level that we all should be working towards. And then Jibreel alayhi salam says again, he says, yes, you're right. Sadaqt. You know, you, you've spoken the truth. You're not lying to me. You're speaking the truth. Subhanallah, you asked a question and this is what you're saying. So he asks the last question. In fact, the second last question. He says, tell me about the hour. Tell me about the hour. Now listen very carefully. When you ask a sheikh a question, a lot of the times he will give an answer. A very knowledgeable sheikh might tell you, I don't know. He's knowledgeable. He's worried. What is he telling you? What is he saying? It's knowledge. So when someone says, I don't know, don't get irritated. Maybe he doesn't. Maybe he wants to check it. Maybe he wants to refer you to someone with more knowledge. So Muhammad وسلم, is being asked, he is being asked, tell me about the hour. You know what he says? Mal mas'oolu anha bi a'lama min as sail Subhanallah. He says, immediately, without being shy, he is the messenger of Allah. He says, the one who is being asked doesn't know any more than the one who is asking in this regard. Amazing. Subhanallah. What an etiquette of learning for us all. Myself included, obviously, all of it is for every one of us. Where you don't know something, don't pretend and send people up the wrong tree. Subhanallah. Especially when it comes to technology today, we don't like to plead ignorance, you know. We all want to know, we all know what's going on. People say, How do I do this? Yeah, I tell you, but you don't know. But I tell you, come, I show you. But you're just trying, just like I would have tried. Subhanallah. Just say, I don't know, and it's over. And some of us, when we know, we say, I don't know because we don't want to help them. That's also another problem. <laughs> May Allah forgive us. But it's an etiquette we do learn. When you don't know something, say it. I don't know. So then he says, okay, what are the signs of the hour? What are the signs of the hour? So he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He makes mention of two interesting points. He says, amatu rabbataha. He says, a slave girl. A slave girl would actually give birth to her master. Or a mistress, meaning the one who is in charge of her. And there are several translations of this. Some, some of the muhaddithin say it depicts the disobedience of the children against their parents. Yes, it may be included in that. Some say it depicts uh, people who perhaps may give birth to the children of those who are their masters in a, in a way that perhaps would only be known closer to the end of time. And one of these ways is when we have surrogacy whereby people are hiring the wombs of those who perhaps happen to uh, be living in poverty and need a bit of money. And you know, some of the women don't want stretch marks on their bellies. So what they do is they say, look, you hold the baby for us. It's not your child, it's ours. We're just renting a space in your belly. Astaghfirullah, but it's happening. It's prohibited in Islam for your information completely. So basically, it's amazing, subhanallah, how... The Prophet ﷺ predicted this. He, he said it a long time back. And the beauty of it is everything that's happening now, the Prophet ﷺ spoke about it at that time, even though they may not have understood it, they memorized it and passed the message on. Perhaps you will get to see it. And we are getting to see different aspects of the same wording in our lives. I've only given you two, but there are so many more. And then he says, you will see. The bare foot, you know, barefoot meaning those who don't even have shoes or slippers. Naked, naked meaning they can't even afford proper clothing. Poor, poor, depicting poverty. Shepherds, wow. Competing with one another. In the height of the buildings they are building. That's what he says in the same hadith. So one might ask, is it prohibited to build high buildings, you know, high-rise buildings? The answer is no, not at all. It's not prohibited. 
Let's not get that wrong. You have a high rise, there's nothing wrong with it. But did you compete with someone? Did you do it because you needed it to be there? Or did you just say, okay, he did one, it's so many meters. I'm doing another one to prove that I'm going to go high. That's now a sign of the hour. Does it make sense? So to have a building that's 100 stories, there's nothing wrong with it. If you need it, there's nothing wrong with it. You know, you need it to accommodate people, you need it for whatever else it is, perhaps office blocks. It was needed, necessary. I wanted to do this and we got it done. And mashallah, it's all rented out and everything is being occupied and used. And it's something that people appreciate and it's there to serve the people and their needs. Alhamdulillah, it's not wrong. When it becomes a sign of the hour is, يَتَطَاوَلُونَ فِي الْبُنْيَانِ At-tatawul means to actually compete with one another when it comes to the building. So I have 20, he has 25. He says, okay, now I have 30, you have 35. I have 800, he will have one kilometer. This guy has one and a half kilometers. That's a problem. We become occupied in this competition and we forget that we have a Lord to go back to. And this is what will divert people away from Allah. They become too engrossed in worldly matters. And this is what we're being reminded of. So this is the hadith in a nutshell. It starts off speaking about Islam, then it goes speaking about Iman, then it speaks about Ihsan, and then it speaks about the hour. And every answer is unique, and it's amazing, and it's concise, and it's precise. I might have taken one hour, 15 minutes talking about it, but to be honest, it was a hadith that doesn't take more than a minute or two to actually recite and to say. But the understanding at the time was so broad and so beautiful, we, subhanallah, do not have the same, exactly the same understanding. However, alhamdulillah, we have opportunities to hear different explanations of it, for it to impact on different aspects of our lives. And this is why if you take a look at the last part of the hadith, you will find something even more interesting. The Prophet ﷺ waited. This man gets up and he walks away and he's gone. And when he's gone, a while later, the Prophet ﷺ says, Oh Umar, do you know who that was? He says, no, I don't. He says, that was Jibreel. He came to teach you the deen. Wow. He came to teach us. So it shows that a Q&A is a way of learning. It's a way of learning. Asking questions and getting answers. And it shows that Allah is so merciful. He sent someone to ask questions so that everyone else could hear what the answers were. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala benefit us. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us in every way. Uh, I, I want to shank, uh, thank the mashayikh here. They've actually given me uh, more time because they'd said, Sheikh Yahya told me that, you know what, you can just carry on. And I said, okay, let's keep it loose-ended, inshallah. So alhamdulillah, I just continued speaking and I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving me this beautiful opportunity to meet with every one of you. And I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for accepting us for this beautiful moment. We are discussing something extremely important that is embracing Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa different aspects of it. Look at how he treated the people. Look at how he taught with so much of ease, so much of love, so much of beauty. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to beautify us as well and to help us to embrace the Prophet ﷺ in this world as well as in the next and to resurrect us with him and to grant us his intercession. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallahi bihamdih. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.